the architect of the nonviolent resistance, the man who wrote the blueprint for the plan, and the giant who executed it beautifully. Our next panel. We often hear people don't need an introduction. Well, this is gospel. Neither of these civil rights icons needs me to say anything more than their name. Can I please get you on your feet to welcome to the stage the great Congressman John Lewis. And remain on your feet, ladies and gentlemen, for the man who is the blueprint, the creator, the architect of it all, Reverend James Lawson. Give these men the honor they so gratefully have earned from all of us here. We're going to get right to it because there is no time to waste. If you've watched the news, if you've read a paper, you know the time is now. Congressman, let's talk about where we are. Millions of people around this country marched in defiance against what they see are gun laws that are not serving the people. Where are we today as it relates to the ability to sustain a movement, to keep it going 50 years after Dr. King's assassination? Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here tonight, to be with you, to be with my teacher, my friend, my brother, Jim Lawson. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to say something, to do something. You cannot afford to be quiet. I think we're going to continue to go forward. These children, these young people, the women of America, but especially the young people are going to get us there. I am very hopeful and very optimistic that these young people will be the leaders of the 21st century. Reverend Lawson, seeing what we've witnessed, as Congressman Lewis said, these young people, the women, the young women on this stage today that are carrying the lessons that you taught Dr. King, that you taught Congressman Lewis, how does it make you feel to see those very tools that you came back with implemented? <laughs> you want me to speak the truth or you just want me to talk? The truth and nothing <laughs> but the truth, so help us God. <laughs> <clears throat> well, number one, I'm going to say my observation is that most activism in the United States today is the activism of the USA and is largely cultural activism. What do you mean by that? I mean by that, that the lessons from the Rosa Parks King movement, which is a separate entity from what's called the civil rights movement, was a different kind of movement. It was a movement that recognized in the first instance that each one of us had power in the very gift of life and that we had to use the gift of life that's a precious gift from creation. We have to use that gift of life and exploit it on the noble sides of humanity to learn to be as alive as we could become, to discover that with the gift of life is the gift of love, and that love is the energy of the universe and is the creative force of the universe, and that if we want to have a struggle, then movement must come out of that first. It cannot come out of a culture of violence. 
It cannot come out of a culture that has for too long pretended to be a land of the free and a home of the brave while doing the most horrible kinds of things and developing a torturous history that has poisoned the airways in the United States in ways that we do not know. And then in addition to that, if we use a struggle that comes out of the gift of life, the gift of love, the gift of truth, that has to be essentially a nonviolent movement. And a nonviolent movement requires a sense of reason that says, if you want social change, you have to be and you have to do the things that produce social change. If you want justice, you must become just people. A struggle for justice must be itself a justice struggle. If you want freedom and access, then your movement must not reflect the enemies of human life, but must reflect equality and liberty and the dignity of all life. Yes. yes. And so Congressman th there's Lewis. No, there's no alternative to that. You cannot overcome wrong with doing wrong. You cannot overcome evil with evil. Uh, as Gandhi said it very well in the words of Jesus, an eye for an eye, soon everyone is blind. A tooth for a tooth, soon everyone is blind. You can't get a new society by planting the seeds of the old society. If you want a new society, you have to plant the seeds that produces a new society. Jesus of Nazareth, and I say that name without all the dogma wrapped around him, insisted that you cannot get grapes from a briar bush. <laughs> yes. Well, you have to get grapes from a grapevine. So how do we today get that love, the resistance, the humanity back into the movement? I well, think if you'd ask anyone here, are they a just person, they would say yes. One of the problems of our society is the fact that we are romantic science of society. We think every generation is going to change us, but we mold every generation with straight up and down USA culture. So how do you get a new world from a new generation using the tactics of the society in which they live? What is the answer, Congressman? Uh, well, what is the answer, Reverend Lawson? The high school movement has a good beginning. That is, they know that enough is enough, and they want to see, uh, they want to have the capacity of a society where they can operate learning across their years, especially as young people, in safety, without the violence, without the guns. Congressman. So that's a good goal. But, I like the goal. <laughs> but Jim Lawson has been my teacher. Yes. He's been my uh, leader. When I was very young, had all my hair and a few pounds lighter, this man imbued me with the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Gandhi. My advice for the young people today is to study the movement. Read the literature, watch the films, the videos, and accept nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. When we were beaten, arrested, and jailed, we accepted it. During the 60s, I was beaten and left bloody, unconscious. I thought I was going to die on that bridge. I thought I saw death during the Freedom Rides in 1961 when black people and white people can be seated together on a Greyhound bus or a trailway bus leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. We were on our way to New Orleans. And Jim Lawson and others of us were arrested. We went to jail. More than 400 people, black and white, 
went to jail in Mississippi. But we didn't strike back. We didn't give up. We didn't give in. We kept the faith. And our action led to the desegregation of public transportation all across the American South. So when people said nothing has changed, I feel like saying, come and walk in my shoes. <laughs> I will show you. Yes. And those shoes are impossible to fill. We'll come a distance, but I, I agree with Jim. Somehow, in, in, in some way, we got to accept the way of peace, the way of love, the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence as a way of living, as a way of life. As a congressperson, I don't vote for military spending. We have enough bombs and missiles and guns to destroy this planet. We need to spend some of our limited resources on taking care of basic human needs. When you hear from the young people who are on this stage, when you hear them, and I watch them come up to both of you asking to sit down and just provide them some advice, the blueprint hasn't changed. What worked 50 years ago can work today, but they feel under siege. You heard them say, you go on social media, they're attacked with words, not with sticks as you were, but still with a hostility that's defeating. How do they keep going? And how do they keep from feeling ignored when the cameras show up for predominantly white protests and their voices are deemed riots when they protest? I've had an opportunity to meet with many of these young people, to march with them. Uh, when the student march took place in D.C., around our nation, in the city of Atlanta, they asked me to march with them. And a young man, that a young student that introduced me, he said our next speaker was the youngest speaker on August 28, 1963. That's the March on Washington. And today, he's the oldest speaker. We have to identify with the hopes, the dreams, and aspirations of these young people and let them lead. They would get us there. Reverend Lasso, when they say, yes, they will, pass the torch to the next generation, what does that mean to you? I didn't hear the first part of your... When you hear people say, it's time to pass the torch to the next generation, what does that mean to you? How is that done? Is that spending more How time? Is that yes, sir. Well, one of the ways it's done is by young people putting themselves in a position where they can hear and feel and study and debate over some of these struggles. I have had the experience in the last 15 years of teaching undocumented students at University of California, Los Angeles, any number of whom because of the sit-in campaigns of students, the Freedom Ride, and other such struggles, began to study and wrestle with them. And the Dream Act people, 10, 12 years ago, began to organize. And they represent students, undocumented, who have taken hold of of, of many of these ideas and disciplines and work and created one of the important nonviolent struggles of the last 20 years. However, they've made, a, they've made a fatal mistake. That fatal mistake is that they listen to the pleas of their elders, not Kent Wong or Jim Lawson. They listen to the pleas of their elders who said the way to get recognition and the legislation for undocumented people is to go to Congress and do it through Congress. And of course, Congress moves today all the time because of the thousands of lobbyists 
from the war industries, from the commercial industries, from Wall Street, from the Pentagon, from the pharmaceutical agencies, so Congress can't hear the pleads of people because there are so many lobbyists who clutter up every congressional office. Yes. So, if young people are going to get their attention, or if movement is going to get their attention, then you have to, in fact, create a struggle where today you put a thousand or two thousand people into the streets of Memphis or Washington DC, and next year you put a million. You, you interrupt the agenda of the status quo in such a fashion yes. that they have to listen to a new agenda and are willing. You, you can, they, they are busy with their own agenda. Mm. And nonviolent struggle around the world over the last 110 years has constantly put on the table the agenda of a new people, whether in Poland, or South Africa, over and over again. They haven't gone to the governments and the legislators to do it. They have rather created their own demands and then with the movement create the power that becomes a new entity in the mix. And that forces then the old powers to move over and to make adjustments and to make some changes. Yes. That's how we got <laughs> All of the legislation of the 60s. Yes. And here we are with a man who's uh, been on both uh, sides all, of that all equation. The, all the bills that people brag about, the, the media never in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Bill of 1965, never says that that wasn't on the mind of the President or the Congress or the lobbyists. But because of the Selma Montgomery March, because of the Freedom Summer, because of the Birmingham campaign, because of the Albany, Georgia movement, because of the Senate Freedom Ride and the Senate campaign, there was an awakening so that that bill could be passed. Yes. And Congress well, Malouche, you've been on both sides that, now. That you've been the young person. That isn't rocket science, but it is <laughs> social science that Gandhi said is the only way to bring about social change of any kind of power or effectiveness. Yes. That's what King represents. And, and Jim, <laughs> some of the presidents that we had saw that. Linda Johnson said, if yeah, you, if absolutely. You, Linda Johnson said, if you want a voting rights act, make me do it. Yes. And we made him do it. John Kennedy was asked by various people and organizations, including the Civil Rights Movement and the Parks King Movement, for a civil rights bill that was inclusive. He said it couldn't be done. But because of the Birmingham campaign and the Washington March, he changed his mind in less than four, four weeks. He, he changed his mind in less than six weeks and said and introduced a civil rights bill that is called the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. He said he was going to do it after he was reelected. But because of the campaigns in Birmingham and elsewhere, and there were more than 1,700 city demonstrations of different kinds in addition to the Birmingham campaign and the Washington March, the net result was John Kennedy was persuaded to introduce the bill in 1963. That's power. <laughs> That's power of the people. Yes. And it can happen again and again. And of course Congress and the lobbyists and Bank America <laughs> all try to persuade us to be conventional with the system that is. But the system that is, is fundamentally rotten. And a rotten system has to have some people who have the courage to say so and to organize to change the rot to ripeness and maturity of spirituality and character that will allow the newness to emerge. I mean, that's the reality. In, in, in addition 
Chairman, we have to use the power of the vote. I've said on many occasions that the vote is the most powerful nonviolent instrument or tool we have in a democratic society, and we have to use it. And too many of us fail to use it. Now, you may recall, and Jim will recall, that the Democratic members of the House of Representatives wanted the Speaker of the House to bring forth a comprehensive bill oh, yes. right. to deal with gun violence, yes. and he refused to do it. So we had a sit-in. My colleagues came to me and said, John, what should we do? We met in my office and we planned and planned. We decided at a certain time, on a certain day, we would have a sit-in in the well of the house. The first time in the history of our country that members of Congress occupied the floor of the house for more than 26 hours. All Democratic members and almost every Democratic senator came over and joined us. And we may do it again. We may do it. Not just when it comes to gun violence, but we have more than 800,000 dreamers. These young people came here as little children. And we are not kind to them. We need to set them on a path to citizenship. And we may have to turn the Congress upside down and America upside down, as Dr. King said, to set it right side up until we get action. You've been on both sides. You've yeah. been the young person ready to turn Congress upside down, and now you're mm -hmm. a member of Congress. Well, since I've been in Congress, I've been arrested five times. <laughs> and, um, and, and I'm probably going to get arrested again for something. <laughs> And, and it's okay. Yes. And you, you, you go and you try to do everything in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, but you have an obligation to disturb the order of things. Do you see the frustration in the young people who are trying to figure it out, who know right from wrong, who know the injustices, whether it's the disproportionate number of black men who are incarcerated, the economic disparities, the game feeling like it is still heavily weighed against you, but not knowing, maybe it's through us not spreading the history in a way that connects, I don't know, that they can sustain the movement through the very plan that was put in place when you were a boy, getting advice from Reverend Lawson. Well, when I was, when I was much younger, Jim was working with an organization called the Fellowship Reconciliation. Yeah. And he had a little comic book. The what? You, you had a comic book. Yeah. It's yes. Martin Luther King. Montgomery Bus Boycott. Yes. And the Montgomery Story. That's right. And we read that little book. Yeah. That's right. We digested. That's right. It taught us everything. Jim, Diane Nash will tell you. Yeah. It prepared us. And we were ready. Yeah. We were ready. Yeah. We have been imbued. We were ready to march into Hell's Fire. And that was, that was one of the few pieces of material that we had relevant to the times in which we live, a comic book story of the Montgomery bus boycott. Wow. And I, I used it all over the South. I passed it out in my travels from, to, to my work in 58, 59, 60. And um, um, it, it, it told the story very effectively. And it told the story as an example of what nonviolent struggle can do. Uh, I want to. I want John uh, and uh, Tamron to uh, just in inject something. That is to say, that at this moment, we, the people of the United States, are headed towards re-electing Donald Trump. Because in, 19, in 2020, the reason is that we are playing his game. And you know, that's, that's why I think sports is such a great model for struggle. Because no basketball team in the recent uh, March Madness went onto the floor planning to play 
the opponent's game. The teams that came out on top and won the most victories during that whole month of March were the teams that went in on the floor geared to make the opponent play their game. You, you mean, you have to have respect for our opponents. And one of the ways you respect your opponent is that you know that the opponent plays his game better than you can play his game. And if you want to lose, you always play the opponent's game. If we, the people of USA, manage to elect a new president in 220, it will be the accident of history and not the way in which we behaved in the last four years or today in 2018. We better find a different way of opposing all the Trumpism represents. What do you see as the way? Huh? What is the game we should be playing? Well, for an example, uh, I don't uh, watch a lot of uh, TV news, uh, but I, had, I, I do watch from time to time certain TV commentary shows. And for the last year and a half, or a year and four months, if you if you see if you see um, uh, a commentary film, a, a, tom, a com, com, commentators talking about any issue, over and over again, in the background is going to be a picture of President Trump. Almost all the time, the one I watch the most is. Uh, MSNBC. I also watch occasionally CNN. Sometimes I switch back and forth when I'm going to do it. And all the time they're reporting the news and a picture of Trump is going to be in most of the TV pictures all the time. I know of no better way for him to be reelected than the news media to keep talking about any issue and there's Trump in the picture. There he is. Every Twitter. Well, the media is going to re-elect President Trump for the U.S. people by the way in which they report this time, at this moment, what's going on in our society. You mark my word. <laughs> mark my word. For Congressman Lewis, looking forward to the midterm election, and no matter who ends up in control of Congress, the reality is the issues that face our communities. And what I mean by that, not just black, people of color, people who live below the poverty line, people who are marginalized. How do they empower themselves no matter who is in control of Congress or who sits in the White House? We have power and we need to use the power. We need to use it. So many of our people, people of color, African American, Latinos, Asian American, Native American, hundreds and thousands and millions of whites, we have power when we don't use it. And with social media today, we should be able to do more than we are doing. We hadn't heard of the internet. Facebook. What is that? And we have all, and we had more than probably 500,000 people, maybe at the March on Washington in 1963. I think it was an undercount. It said 250,000. We, we, we didn't have social media when we marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday, but we changed America. People couldn't stand to see people been beaten down. They couldn't stand to see people be tramped about horses, tear gas and bull whips. So they changed. We have to create another powerful period of nonviolent direct action. 
If we can do it, I'm convinced we can do it. Put hundreds and thousands and millions of people in the streets. Why do we have all these members in Congress today deciding they're not going to run? The handwriting is on the wall. We're going to take the House of Representatives back, and if we work, we're going to take the Senate back. I'm going to work my butt off to see that it happens. And Reverend Lawson, I'll give you the last word on this as we may see a change in the makeup of Congress. Ultimately, what you started out the beginning of your message was humanity, finding that voice within all of us that can reach in in a nonviolent way to affect change. You said to me, do you want me to tell you the truth? So I'll ask you today, do you believe that we are on the verge with the young people, with where we are, are we on the verge of recreating what you created 50 years ago? No. Say it directly. We, we, the people of the USA, really do not have a political party. We may have bits and pieces here and there and yonder. I consider John one of my Congress people and a number of others. We have bits and pieces, but we do not have a political party. If we are to regain a political party, that moves in the directions that the country was moving in, we, the people, are going to have to organize from a nonviolent perspective and create campaigns in city after city that helps to forge a, a new party, a new democratic party maybe, that will do our will, that will look to our interests. Look, sisters and brothers, Look, sisters and brothers, Harvard University produced a study of the costs of the Iraq war. I think that report was issued to me two years ago. Harvard University study indicated we have spent six trillion dollars for the Iraq war. Six trillion dollars for the Iraq war. Now, if we the people want Head Start and quality education for every boy, every girl, everywhere across our country, we're going to have to be in the streets to see to it that no more six million do trillion dollars are going to be spent for war, but they're going to be spent on quality education, quality housing, on non-discriminatory economics, on the equality of economics across the board. I maintain that our present economic system is a plantation capitalist system, ideologically and structure. It is aimed at the gathering of wealth by the plantations. It is aimed at saying that working people, working families do not need to have sustainable incomes and steady and stable work. It says that they are more like slaves and do not deserve to have living wages. That's plantation capitalism. The fact that we have 160 million people at the bottom half of our population who do not have the wealth of the property of the three wealthiest men in the United States is in itself an indication that our economy is from top to bottom rotten. 160 million people do not deserve to be at the bottom of the ladder on food stamps and unable to support their children. Shelter insecurity, work insecurity, food insecurity, medical insecurity. That's the deliberate plan of the economy, though many of the decent people who are in that economy would say that's not what they wanted. But good intentions without good methods will lead to hell, not to heaven. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, you I'm, asked I'm, for the truth, we got the truth. There but you have it. it. Good intentions is the road to hell.
rather than the There you have it, Congressman. Good intentions have to have good ideology, good structures, good movements, good attitudes across the board. Across if they don't the board. have them, we can't do it. Before we turn it over to April for the next panel, I will ask Congressman Lewis to end it on this, which is where we started. Where do we go from here? Well, I deeply believe and I feel that we can humanize America and create, create an America that is at peace with itself, where no one is left out or left behind because of their race or because of their color. But what we need in America is what I call back in the 60s a nonviolent revolution, a revolution of values a revolution of ideas. I said to people all the time that you must never get lost in a sea of despair. You have to continue to believe that we can do it. We can overcome. It may take a few days, maybe a few years, but we will get there. And I believe that. Um, I've seen people who lived in fear. They were afraid, just living afraid. But I also have seen people grow up while they're sitting on lunch kind of stools, or while they are marching from Selma to Montgomery. And these same people, or their children's children, will lead us. They will help create the beloved community but we must create a society that respects the dignity and the worth of every human being. And we don't do it with missiles and guns. We do it with teaching people to be human. Can we be a little more human? Can we just love everybody and not hate anybody? As Dr. King said, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. The way of love is much better for all of us. Thank you. Let's again thank these great men for their wisdom then, their wisdom now, and their words that will live forever.